next on MLR Weekly, which doesn't have an offseason. New York General Manager Steve Lewis on the Combine and updates in the Sevens world. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News on the situation in Atlanta. John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning with headlines and news. And Cam Moody of the Can-Am Rugby Tournament in Saranac Lake. Rugby Wrap-Ups MLR Weekly brought to you by Sheehy Auto Stores. It's easy at Sheehy. The Pig & Whistle, New York City. The world's best rugby pub. And Lean and Limber. Stretching your way to a healthier lifestyle. to this week's MLR Weekly as presented by Rugby Wrap-Up, Matt McCarthy in a very hot New York City. And it's great to see you. You don't want to hear me whining, but you may want to hear that we don't stop doing MLR Weekly because the season's over. Oh, no. We go back to work, and we are at work. And we'll be at work on the Rugby Odds and on the College Rugby Wrap-Up. So under the Rugby Wrap-Up platform, you'll have three shows. MLR Weekly, the Rugby Odds, and the College Rugby Wrap-Up. So with that, let's get to this week's MLR Weekly. We've got a great show. We've got Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. We've got Cam Moody of the Can-Ams, the uh, Saranac slash Lake Placid Tournament, which is classic and great. you got to go. But we'll be streaming it so you can watch. And there'll be a sprinkling of MLR players there. We also have the general manager of Rugby New York, Mr. Steve Lewis, who is at the MLR Combine. And before we do any of that, We have our recurring segment, Rugby Morning's Coffee Break with John Fitzpatrick with MLR News headlines and whatnot. John, good to see you. Welcome back to the program. How are you? What do you got? Hey, man, I just want to start off by saying happy trails to flanker Luke Beauchamp. Luke, who played two seasons with the Houston Sabercats, season with the Austin Girl Gronies, and was named vice captain of the Chicago Hounds in the 2023 MLR season, has officially retired from rugby but matt he will still be sticking around he's currently the men's rugby head coach at texas a&m the aggies right is that the aggies mm-hmm. agriculturals is aggies right farmers was taken it was tech it was initially going to be the texas a&m farmers they changed it to the agriculturals and then it became shortened to the aggies congratulations on a great career luke you are truly a good champ next let's move on over to the Eastern Conference where, where the Miami Sharks have confirmed on social, and this is probably no duh, but they will compete in the Eastern Conference for the 2024 what? MLR what? season. What? I know, it's crazy, right? Shut your front door. I will, but first, Matt, before we get to all of that, the big question will be how will the Miami Sharks upstage Miami RFC? Of course, Miami RFC just brought on probably the greatest soccer player in the world in Messi. Who will the Miami Sharks sign to upstage Messi? I'm sorry, were you talking soccer? Oh my God. All they have to do is open their eyeballs and watch rugby. Next! I could not agree more with Matt McCarthy on that one. Hey, let's move on over to the MLR. Whatever bring up soccer on this show again. Next! So Matt, we are less than a month from the 2023 MLR Collegiate Draft. Sam Gala, who went number one overall to the Dallas Jackals last year, was the seemed to be the consensus overall pick, right? Are you getting a sense for who will go number one overall in this year's draft? Well, f- first off, Hala Fagala, and he had a great season with the Dallas Jackals, as did Colin Gross, another uh, pick in that last draft for D.C. Uh, but I can tell you that it won't be either of them as the number one pick this year. But we are in the war room getting ready for the college rugby wrap-up edition the draft edition uh so we'll have those uh picks and more so look for that we're in that war room with mlr weekly tro the rugby odds and rugby wrap-up so you know john i think you'll be joining us with rugby morning so we're going to get all that together i know that you're asking me a question that i can't answer because you wanted to see me fail on this program next man that's all i got back to you in new york 
All right. Thanks, John. It's Patrick of Rugby Morning. And don't go away because we don't have a recap of last week's action, but we do have more action ahead of us. We'll be right back after this. Need a great price on a new vehicle? Sheehy makes it easy. Easy Price shows you our lowest prices on the Mid-Atlantic's largest selection. Find your best price online or at any of our 31 dealerships. It's easy at Sheehy. Sheehy.com. You need your cleats? You need them tomorrow? If you order today by 3 p.m. New York time or noon L.A. time, they can have them to you tomorrow. Young, old, male, female, if you're playing on turf, if you're playing on grass, if you're playing in the rain, you're playing in the heat, they've got you covered. RugbyNow.com. Go there now. And we're back with Mr. Cam Moody of the Can-Am, one of my favorite tournaments. Great setting, Lake Saranac or Saranac Lake and Lake Placid. It's been going on since the early 70s, but give us the elevator pitch, Cam, for people that don't know what it is. Hey, Matt, this is the 49th annual year for uh, Can-Ams in Saranac Lake and Lake Placid, so we're really excited. We've got almost 100 teams this year. We're hoping to hit that magic 100 number with a few late registrations, and uh, we're going to have everything from men and women's club and social all the way up to an over 60s division. Uh, we've got a eight team over 35s division that's going to be ultra competitive this year and we're bringing a lot of new off the field fun as well so we're looking forward to it there's good fodder going on because you you're making this more of an event like last year you had the uh the beer tent but now you're expanding that for friday and saturday tell us about that so last year we initiated the inaugural can-am carnival and we had a beer tent and bouncy houses for the kids and stuff like that this year we're going to expand on that um not only making it a bigger event for the ruggers and spectators coming but also to involve the locals a bit and we're going to have bands down at riverside park in saranac lake on friday saturday night uh, we're going to be serving beer and food down there with our our partner the hotel saranac which is a historic hotel here in downtown saranac lake yeah. and um on sunday as soon as the live stream of the games are done down there we're also going to have a band sunday night so hopefully we keep some of the people around for a few more hours enjoying telling stories about the weekend and uh not only enjoying the rugby fields and the tournament but our town as well all right so last year and the year before we had a a couple of MLR players coming up there. I think we're going to see a sprinkling of them again. You know, maybe the periphery guys, but the, you also had some 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 guys that actually started in MLR games last year. So this it, that's where this all ties into this being on MLR Weekly is that we'll also have some some quality talent up there. Absolutely, the club division is is ultra competitive. Uh, for the men. And this year, we're going to have the club women too. So uh, we've raised the stakes a little bit with the talent and, and ability that's here. Uh, of course, we've got our own Saranac Lake Mountaineer, Kevin Morgan, who got a little taste of the MLR right. this year. Uh, and he's back and, and hungry to win a club championship for our hometown team. So we're looking forward to it. It's going to be 16 teams in the men's club side. Uh, and I believe we're at 13 or 14 in the women's club side. So uh, we're going to fill that one out before the tournament kicks off, but we're going to have some really good competitive rugby all weekend long up here across all of our divisions. And where can people watch? So we're going to have the live stream. Um, that'll be a link to that on our website on Sunday during the finals. Uh, but also we're going to be live streaming right down at the Can-Am Carnival at Riverside Park. So you can go down there, you can have something to eat and enjoy a couple beers and watch all the games from there. Uh, and of course you can watch field side um, and then the games will be recorded. So you can even watch them at home when you get back. And the link will also be blasted out uh, through all our social media. So easy access for anyone looking to watch. Perfect. Perfect. Looking forward to it. We're going to have nothing but sunshine this year. But oh, it's it doesn't matter. Wonder. It doesn't matter if it rains, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great place. It's, the, the lakes are unbelievable. The scenery is great. And uh, you got to go get your teams and it's not too late. Cam Moody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. We'll see you soon. All right. That's Cam Moody of the Can-Ams. You got to get up there. And if you've got a team, get in there. But right now we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street.
And we're back. And we're back with Mr. Stephen Lewis, the general manager of Rugby New York. He's also a czar in the sevens world, but we'll get to the sevens in a little bit. First off, Stephen, first order of business, how are you? Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for inviting me back on your uh, blockbuster of a show, Matthew. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Stephen, uh, in terms of the MLR, your season didn't turn out with another championship as you'd hoped, but the, the repeat of such a thing is a difficult task. How do you feel about the team season briefly before we get into the other stuff? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're the only team that's always made the playoffs, right? So we, we do set a high bar. We do have expectations. So to to make the playoffs and not proceed to the conference final was a disappointment. You know, I think everyone involved in the organization was disappointed with that that result. But um, it, it's not an easy thing, A, to win it, and not an easy thing to repeat it. So... You know, sometimes you have to take your lumps, and we weren't good enough this year. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, moving forward, you just went out to the MLR Combine. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it, it's not strictly speaking MLR Combine. It's the Collegiate Shield, right, which is a sort of privately run event. Uh, really done a fantastic job by Brandon Sparks and Nick Colling. Okay, so those are the guys that came up with the concept. Utah very graciously host it, and they had fantastic facilities, field, the you know practice facilities, everything out there was top notch. But yes, the point of it is for college players to be able to expose themselves to you know MLR GMs prior to the draft, the MLR draft, which is coming up August seventeenth. So that's the purpose of this event. It's the second year of the event, uh, growing quite nicely. Um, not quite yet all the top collegiate players from all over the country or everyone who's in the draft, but, you know, it's getting there. It's working towards that. And from my perspective, um, it was a resounding success. Yeah, so you you mentioned the uh, the improvement from last year, and it's only going to improve. You know, some people that have knocked it specifically on Reddit, you got to have some patience with this kind of thing. It doesn't happen overnight. The combine is an American sporting phenomenon, right? And there can sometimes be too much, in my opinion, emphasis put on sort of, you know, times and stats. So if you're rugby and you're looking at talent, you need to see them play. You need to see them under live bullets, under pressure. So so this sort of hybrid, which is a sort of combined scrimmage hybrid, is the way to go. Um, so any detractor or naysayer, any opportunity that a young player has to showcase himself in front of a potential employer, what's wrong with that? All right, so let's move on to the sevens world a little bit. There's some stuff going on. Why don't you fill us in? Yeah, so World Rugby have announced the new format for the World Series. So I think a couple of the key things are HSBC are back as a sponsor, so that's important. So they've sort of re-upped their commitment to the sevens game. Um, World Rugby have, they're, they're looking to sort of rebrand it, make it a summer festival. They're mirroring the Olympic-style event, so it's a three-day event both men and women at every leg, um, but reduced teams. So 12 teams, 12 teams. Ooh. That's, yeah, that's the format. Um, eight venues, that's down from 11. It was, seven was mooted, but I think um, they've gone with eight. Interestingly, all the obvious ones are there, right? Dubai starts it off, Cape Town, Hong Kong. Um, in North America, they've retained both Vancouver and LA. That's important. Yeah, important for North American fans. And then really the only addition, the only new venue is the uh, finale, which is going to be held in Madrid, Spain. Oh, wow. Madrid. That's interesting. So that was a Spanish accent, right? I, I'm sorry. I, it just comes out. It's just so natural. It just rolls off the tongue. Um, so with the 12 teams, is there a tier two competition? Is there a promotion relegation thing going on? Absolutely. So they're, they're trying to increase that um, sort of um, jeopardy factor, right? Uh, so the final weekend in Madrid, basically the top eight teams will have assured themselves um, being retained for the following year. But the bottom four will go into a tournament with the top four of the Challenger Series, which is the second tier of World Rugby Sevens product. And those eight teams, the top four of those eight teams are permanent members the following year. So that's a good thing because that, that does give finally some opportunity for teams from different countries to, to have a uh you know a pathway to move on up and that will then dictate the 12 teams that are in the olympics nope that will dictate uh, the 12 teams which are in the world series the following year okay so then how do we arrive at the olympic 12 is it 
Yep, that's a whole different process, which is uh, mostly underway, mostly completed, actually. So Olympic qualifications for Paris next year. Uh, top four from the World Series, that's already established. Then you have a series of regional qualifiers. So, for instance, the USA are going to Langford. That's the North American qualifier in August. They have to go there, beat Canada, ABC, always beat Canada, and Jamaica and whoever else. Um the African qualifier is in Zimbabwe in September, so I'm coaching Nigeria in that. You have no, you have firsthand experience with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are different, you know, South America is a qualifier, which is already done. Asia is a qualifier. Europe is a qualifier. So that's how that Olympic field is put together. And then, of course, your favorite word, there is a, a repertoire tournament this year, which is the Last Chance Saloon. So, so that Olympic field is mostly set. Um, this World Series announcement is separate. Similar formats, separate competition. And are you uh, happy about this new format? I'm not really keen on a three-day event. I do, I'm an addict. I'm a sevens addict. I don't know if I go three days in a row. Yeah. So so I think um, I'm not quite sure about that format. Stephen, final thoughts on 15s or sevens? Yeah, it's like never-ending season, right? You get you get over with uh, MLRs done and completed. Now you're, we are right back into sort of player retention and player recruitment. On that front, you got sevens kicking off. It's the summer club sevens coming. Um, fall fifteens amateur. The, the, the game, the global game, just doesn't seem to stop anymore. Which is, you know, fine if you love it like we do. All right, but let me ask you this then: Is there a plan in the works for maybe MLR players to continue playing in the off season under some kind of MLR umbrella, or maybe an MLR sevens in the down the road? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this sevens thing has been mooted, right? And I think it's only a matter of time, probably, um, before there will be some form of MLR sevens. It, it's just, as you said, it's a natural, right? You've got a brand, you've got venues, you've got players. So I, I personally see that, and there are some others within the league who see that as very much a viable thing. Um, some others, however, feel that we should concentrate on the 15 side of it for now. But um, I, I think ultimately that will come. All right, well. Thank you, Mr. Stephen Lewis. It's always a pleasure. You're welcome. All right. We'll be right back with Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News after this. This is the Rugby Odds, where an unlikely pundit panel of a wordsmith, a WWE legend, a rugby star, and a supermodel scour the globe, seeking best bets and bad behavior. Are you not entertained? We're back with Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. Brian, the uh, first of all, how are you? I'm doing all right, Matt. I'm doing all right. Just all right, Brian? No, there's no MLR to, to watch anymore, so I'm a little bit sad. But we do have the draft coming up, so maybe that's something to look forward to. Guy, you got the RugbyNetwork.com where you can watch the replays. I'm looking forward to watching the final yet again. That's a good point. Maybe I'll go back and... Uh, Maybe I'll watch that game that the Arrows won 10 times in a row and make myself feel a little bit better. They'll be like 10 and 0. Hey. But, uh, Brian, people say, what are you going to do? You know, what are you doing in the offseason with MLR Weekly? I'm like, the same thing I've been doing for two years. Keep going. There's plenty of talk to talk about. And one of those things I want to uh, do with you, just part in particular, is a hypothetical. The Powerball here is up to $900 million. Brian Ray. You just won it. And after taxes, you still have about $200 million left, which is plenty to become an owner of an MLR franchise. And rumors have it that Rugby ATL is a team that's in trouble. A, because uh, they need a new owner. And B, the owners don't want to cover that team if they don't get a new owner. So you could probably get a good price. Let's say... All that happens, you get Rugby ATL, 
what's your first move? Yeah, well, the first thing you've got to do, I think, is clean house uh, from leadership from top to bottom. Um, you know, I, I think it's fair to say at this point that the rebrand was a complete disaster, uh, totally backfired. Um, I don't really know what they were thinking when they did that, but it didn't work. Uh, you know, if you look at the passionate, you know, obviously there's a passionate group of rugby fans down in Atlanta. They got that franchise off on the right foot, but, uh, you know, after, you know, obviously Marcus Calloway unfortunately passed away and, and, and Scott Lawrence left, uh, you know, that was kind of the guts of the team, wasn't it? And after that, things have been going steadily downhill and the rebrand did not help, um, and I think they have to be accountable for that. So I would scrap the entire leadership structure. I would also probably change the coaching staff as well. You know, whether, you know, whatever you think of Stephen Brett, he just, he hasn't been working out there in ATL. So I think for a fresh start would be the number one thing uh, that I would do if I bought that team. You know, that, that rebranding, the implementation of it and the deeming that it was necessary were both fatal flaws or fatal, fatally bad decisions. Uh, you lost or alienated a good portion of your fan base. Do you get them back by going back to being the Rattlers? It's a tough call. Uh, you know, once you've, you know, driven the nail into something and I mean, really, I mean, completely wiping it, taking off that terrific mural by Chance Wingluski that he'd, painted i mean that was to me was shocking but anyways here we are i don't know if you can if you can dial back the clock and go back so I, what i think you can do is try and connect with the local community again and ask them what they think say hey you know we've screwed this up how can we get back to uh you know something where that you want to support do you do you want the rattlers to come back would you like to create a new identity and i would just i mean obviously the passion when there was there that whole you know facebook live or whatever session they had had huge attendance more attendance than that than i think some of the games yeah. uh so obviously somebody cares about it so let's reconnect with the community again and 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 take some of their advice for once yeah i said on this program when that mural went away when they painted over chance when Gluski's mural. Uh, and it's not, a, it wasn't a, a mural of chance when Gluski chance when is an artist, as well as a prop, he painted it. It was all, it was awesome. That just completely showed no, not a modicum of, of understanding of your fan base and the history of a team. And it was just, okay. I was like, okay, this is going to, this is going to end poorly. And it did. And the team, you know, the team performed okay under these circumstances. They they were they they had some glimpses and they showed what they could potentially do. It's a shame that it's the executive offices or, or perhaps the executive offices that really just destroyed a season. Yeah, they just stripped the identity. And you could tell. I mean, you could look at, you know, the, the coaches when they were there at that meeting. They did not look comfortable at all. They were clearly not on board with the changes. And when you do that to your own coaches, when they think, the you know, that you're swimming in a different direction from, from the higher-ups, that's a terrible start place to be starting a season where you're trying to be competitive and get into the playoffs. So, I mean, they just stabbed them, you know, their own team in the back by doing that. So I, I just think it was a terrible, poorly advised decision if there was any advice at all. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that, that's where we are. So if I was taking over that team, it would just be clean slate. Let's, let's start again. Obviously, there's some players I'd want to keep, but uh, uh, everybody else has got to go. Anyway, while we're on the fix it and ain't broke, I want to do a recurring thing with you each week here. We'll pick a team, and I want you to give me the skinny on what you think they need to do for the next year. Let's start close to home for you with your Toronto Arrows. Yeah, well, I mean, it's no secret that, uh, you know, I think they need a change at the, certainly in the coaching staff, and I wouldn't be surprised if that change is, is made. Um, you know, I just heard a lot of excuses from uh, from Pete Smith, unfortunately, and I know he was dealt a tough hand, but everybody is. I mean, you know, everybody, you're always going to have injuries in this game. You've got to figure it out. You've got to have some kind of plan to deal with it when it does happen. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like last year where we had, you know, the arrows had nine guys playing scrum half, something like that. I mean, they were spread out. Yeah, there's lots of injuries, but 
you know, you've got to have faith in the guys, you know, below that, you know, the whole, you know, next man up routine. It just didn't seem like that was happening this year. It didn't seem like the guys who were coming in were on the same page and anything. So I think uh, definitely need to change at the coaching uh, level. And the other thing I would say that really didn't work out this year was kind of the recruiting if you look at all the international players, and I'm mainly, mainly focused on the guys who are not Canadian eligible, um, the guys who came in, uh, you know, they just didn't work out. How many of them actually, you know, would you call success, success this year? Whether it was lack of form or injury or both, maybe one or two of them turned out to be okay. Yeah. So I would look at recruitment pretty heavy. A, a lot of those guys, certainly I would not bring back. Um, you know, obviously I'd, I'd want to bring Lolani Faliva back as uh, you know, he stands out, but he wasn't a new recruit. He, he was a returning player, but uh, I would look very closely at my overseas contingent. Cause I mean, you can only have so many of them on your team. They better count. And if they're not counting, then what are you spending your dollars for? And you could basically come close to fielding an MLR all-star team with Canadians playing for other teams. Yeah. You know, they've lost a lot of the best uh, Canadian talent now. And I think they were just frustrated you know, the after, you know, obviously that whole year spent down south will kind of hurt everybody. You know, you get tired of seeing the same guys every day. You're not hanging out with your friends and family back home and that kind of thing. And you're stuck. The dog. Yeah. So that uh, obviously did not uh, help matters at all. Um, but they've got to get something back here. They've got to start getting some of these. Uh, you know, if they can't bring those guys back, and I, I don't think they'd want to, especially the Free Jacks, they're not going anywhere. So uh, you got to start looking at the younger Canadian talent. And to their credit, they did bring in, you know, some of the guys this year. Kieran Breen, obviously, yeah, he was injured for a little bit, but when he was in there, he looks promising. Uh, Brendan Black, the young 18-year-old, the fullback, uh, certainly one for the future. Guys like that, I'd like to see. Uh, Deshaun Bowen, they gave him a shot, and man, he was electric when he had ball. You know, he has some things to work on, clearly. He but can scoot. Yeah, there's some uh, some promise there. There's, there's something to work with, um, you know. So, and, and Owen Rutan, I should mention, mention him as well. He kind of, uh, you know, didn't get a lot of playing time in the first half of the season. A few eyebrows raised. What's going on here? Is he going to get a shot? Second half of the season, he got some playing time. Hey, this guy could play a bit, you know. He, he did pretty well. So, you know, I'd like to see them give some more chances to those guys and let's build uh, build the program up with these younger Canadian guys if you're not going to retain uh, the, the top-level talent that has now gone elsewhere. Is it a tough sell to say to players that you want to bring into Toronto to say, oh, by the way, we're going to start 90% of our uh, games on the first half of the season on the road? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think so. All right. Well, Brian, uh, I want you to start thinking about next week's team, and we're going to move our way down the eastern seaboard, and that's the champions of the league. So that's who I'm going to ask you to uh, dissect and say what they need to do. That's Should an easy first. one. They That's just got to tell us is it who's though? Wooji? Is it Who though? is Wooji? Well, you've, you've seen on this program that we tried to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> hey, Wooji. Are you Alex Magleby or are you not Alex Magleby? No, he's not. Jeez. All right. There's still a lot more okay. to be un unraveled in that story. Because I'm stalking Woodgy. All right. On that note, I want to thank Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News, Mr. John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning, Mr. Steve Lewis of Rugby New York, and Mr. Cam Moody of the Can Ams. And thank you for tuning in. Please check out our other shows, including the critically acclaimed The Rugby Odds, the College Rugby Wrap Up. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Please join our weekly newsletter and please sign up for our American Red Cross Blood Donor Team.